So the agenda today, it's all about corridors. So um, basic corridors, which you may have come across before. These are your template style designs, which are standard to all software packages. Uh, target mapping is basically adding strings to the equation. Then we will go from there and start going into offset assemblies. Now, the first two are quite basic, and they're, they're in nearly every package. The offset assemblies are more interesting, and the phrase skewed cross-section kind of gives a hint of what it's going to be. So I won't describe it now. We will get to it and see it properly. So conditional sub-assemblies, these are uh, decision-based criteria. And um, they came out as an add-on for a download for subscription customers towards the end of the 2009 release. They're included on 2010. Now, we haven't done a huge amount with them yet, because they're just brand new, but they do work, and we have to just find some cases to um, make them work for us. Then we have marked points. Now, the marked points are probably my favorite side of this. They basically um, allow you to work from the inside out, Minor problem with my PowerPoint here. Anyway, uh, work towards the CL. Let's just go back here. So they, they allow you to, instead of doing the standard projecting from your center line out to the edges, they allow you to work in the opposite direction, which opens up the whole world of possibilities. Now, in general, most users stick with the first two. So using a basic corridor with target mapping will do all your jobs. What the other options below do is enhance the functionality. So um, the way I think about this is that it's, you have to understand the first two and then you have to be aware of the offsets, the conditional and the mark points. So if a situation arises where you want to do something with conditional assemblies, you know it's possible and you get in touch with us. If, if enough people tell us to do a session like this on conditional assemblies, I'll be delighted. It's, it's, it's stuff I enjoy doing. So we will work off that. Now, basic corridors, we'll just dive straight into it. This PowerPoint is more of a reminder for me than it is for anything else. So let's just start with a template-based approach and show how it works. So let's go to the software. Now, I'm going to try to move a lot slower this week because there was a lot of feedback saying that I was zooming too much last week. So. What I do is go to my home tab, I go to corridor, and I'll make a simple corridor. I give it a name. So it will default to a name corridor next counter. I will call it, say, Sean. Sean test, in keeping with my usual naming conventions. So I'll press OK. It prompts you to pick your horizontal geometry. So I will pick the horizontal geometry here. It prompts you for the vertical, so I'll pick the vertical here, and it prompts you for the cross section. Now I'm just going to zoom here, so it'll be a bit of lag. I'm going to pick this cross section here. And I'm now presented with a screen which basically confirms what I've picked for each one. Now if we were doing batters, we would pick our surface here and leave the software know which surface to use for the batters. Because we're starting at the pure basics, I'm leaving that out. So I press OK, and I get my corridor model here. Now that is the most basic thing that every package in the world can do. You've got horizontal, vertical, cross-section, and you model a corridor based off that. Now some of the things that we need to be aware of. You can right-click, go to your corridor properties, and build a surface from that corridor. So when I get to my properties here, I've got a tab called Surfaces. And what I do is I create a new surface from the top left button here. I will call this Simple Surf. You give it a style, so a standard style from your, your template. I'll use Triangulation Cyan, so it stands out a little bit. And then I must pick what I want to add to it. Now, at its most basic level, you can ignore these two pull-downs on the top, press your plus button, and you'll get a surface. We will talk briefly about what these allow you to do, because there's quite a bit of flexibility. So when I press OK to that, it builds me my corridor surface. Now you will see we have some long triangulation happening. So what you have to do is apply a boundary to that surface, 
Now there's an improvement on 2010 for doing that. On 2009, 2008 it was quite awkward. So I go back into my corridor properties. So the tab just next to my surfaces is a tab called boundaries. So I press boundaries. And when I right click my simple surf, I've got a few options here. So I can add interactively by drawing a boundary myself. I can add from an existing polygon, which is where I just simply draw AutoCAD polygons and go from there. Or I can say automatically add based off a point code. Now ETW is edge of travel, which is like the edge of my road. So if I add from there and I tell it that it's an outside boundary, which I've told it here already, and press OK, what we should see is our surface model. Okay, I've done something wrong here. What we should see is that surface model um, trimming the triangles. Now the other option you have is to add a shrink wrap boundary. So let's just remove that one. And let me find my shrink wrap. Okay, I, th I seem to have disabled this. So we'll come back to this. We'll do some more on corridor or surface boundaries and surfaces in a second. But we'll just temporarily get rid of our surface. What I'll do is I'll just change my style to um, no display. So we show the simple thing by itself. So that's one of the things you can do without getting into fancy strings and stuff. You can build a surface model. The other thing you can do from the corridor properties is add symbols. So you have slope patterns here. So I can say I want to add a slope pattern from here, from that lane, to that lane. This is a bit of a silly pattern to add. It makes no sense. but And the pattern I want to use is slope schemes. You can build a variety of these. And there's a wizard here to help you do it. So you've got the usual tadpoles. You've got the lines and the, the various schemes that you, could, you would think of in the past. So you press OK and OK. And what we've now got I just zoom in here a little bit. We've got these slope schemes coming in. So that will take care of the aesthetics for you, which is the, the, the basics of it. So we've got surface creation, boundaries, and symbols. Now let's just go back into this and do something more interesting with the surfaces. What I'm going to do, I'm zooming around a little bit here, um, let me go to my next PowerPoint to explain it better. So when you build your assemblies, you've got multiple um, gradings. So you have your, your, your top surface, you have your sub-base, your sub-base 2, and you have your curved area, your footpath area, all these various regions. So on this slide, the diagram on the right-hand side, which I can draw on here, I think. I'll go to my highlighter. This one here, I'm just drawing some yellow over the actual surface. That is your default top surface. So when you build the surface, it builds the whole thing. The one just below it, which I'm looking at right now here. In this option, the surface we want is just the base of the paved area. We don't care about the footpath or the actual curb and gutter. We want to just show our excavated area for the road. The one below that again, it's our curbed area. This one is our footpath area, and this is our footpath and our back of curb. So as different scenarios arise, you want to build surfaces from different parts of your corridor model. The good news about this is that it's very simple to do it in the software. So we'll go back to our corridor properties and we will go to our surface. So I'll turn that one off. I'll leave it there, but I'll just tick the off box on it. Let me just leave the screen catch up a little bit. So I've turned my my surface off here. I'll build a second one, which I will call subbase. Now in this case, I'm going to go and say I want to build it from my subbase codes as opposed to my top codes. So I pick subbase and I add that. And when I press OK, that builds me a surface, but the surface is going to be the bottom surface. Well, I can get more more funky than this if I want. So just to explain how this works, let me go to my subassembly properties and go to the actual help. Now my screen is lagging behind a little bit here, so I'll wait for the catch up. Now I'll just scroll to the bottom here. And what you should see when it catches up is 
this is my coding diagram here. Now it looks quite complex, but it's actually quite simple. You have P1, P2, P3, P4. So P1 is called ETW. So I can basically build a surface model for my strings as well as my cross sections. So what I'm saying is this. When I go back into my surface properties, sorry, my, my corridor properties, I can build a different one. I can say build a surface here from strings. So instead of picking paved area or sub-base area, I change my data type from links to feature lines. Now they, they, they can be considered as sections and strings for more familiar terms. So my point code here is ETW. I add that. I can also add, say, my center lane area. Add that one as well. That will build me a surface model. The exact same procedure as my previous one, only I'm working from strings. So the the idea here is that as situations arise where more specific models need to get built, you can do it very, very easily. Now, I'm showing this on the most simple corridor model because it's easier to understand. You can do it as well on the more complex ones, which we will hopefully get to later on. So this diagram here, all these scenarios can be done. So that's the basic, basic stuff. Now, moving on to the target mapping and the string-based stuff. The, the trick here is that the, the last line I've mentioned here, it's all about the sub-assemblies. That is very, very true. You pick your sub-assemblies carefully, and you can do all kinds of groovy things with them. Let's just go back into this one here. And I'm actually going to erase my corridor and do it from scratch again, just to make it simple. Now, in this case, we're going to use some of the functionality we had from last week to do with the offset assemblies and other bits and pieces like that. So I'm going to select this center line. I'm going to select offset alignment. And I'm going to select... Um, now, I want to go to the left only. So what I do is press 0 for the right-hand side. I'll give this 10 meters to the left. I'll just press OK. So I've got my offset alignment here. To make it more interesting, I will do some of the functionality from last week. I'll add a new offset, and I will drag the width out to here. And I will then pick the transition area and skew it so it occurs over a chainage range. So all we've got here is um, the left-hand side of our road skewing in and out for ourselves. So what we now do is we go and we create a corridor again. So I'll, again, I'll click on Create Simple Corridor, and I'll pick my center line. Now, I'm graphically picking everything. I can also right-click the select. So for my profile here, I'm going to right-click on my screen, and I pick from my pull-down list. So the one I want is my design profile. We press OK for that. And I've forgotten what I've named my assemblies as. So I'm actually going to pick my assembly graphically, because I don't know what I've called these. So I pick this one here, so uh, which is assembly one. Now I should pay attention to my mapping parameters here. So what I've got is my width for my left and right lanes. What I'm going to tell the software is, for my left lane, I want you to ignore the actual assembly and go look at the alignments, which I just selected here. And the one I'm after is CL outside left. I could do this graphically as well by pressing on that green icon, but I happen to know my name here. So I press Add, and my name appears in here. I press OK, and I press OK again. So what we now see is my corridor built, and the width of the left lane is skewed out to match my, um, my new alignment. That's very, very basic, simple stuff. So what it's doing is it's holding the cross grade and stretching it out to meet that alignment, which is nice and simple. Now, if you look at this and think about a serious job, you're going to suddenly have to do a lot of alignments and a lot of profiles to take care of it. And if it's a reconstruction job, you're going to have to make alignments and profiles from your survey strings. So what's happened is on the more recent versions of the software, 2009 and 2010, these target mappings work for polylines and feature lines as well as alignments and profiles. So what I'm doing here is I'm drawing 
a polydyne. I'm snapping to my surface model. So that's my new survey string here. I'll just highlight that here so it shows up. So I've just on that roughest guts. And what I want to do is snap my right hand width to that polydyne. So if I go select my corridor model. Now I'm right clicking still from a bad habit. I can go and pick my corridor properties from my ribbon up here, which I've just done. And when I get in here, I go to my parameters tab. And what I'm after here are my targets, which is that button right where my, my mouse handle is right now. And so you can see here that the width alignment for my left hand lane has been set. For my right hand lane, it still hasn't been set. So I'm going to press the section here. And the trick now is that I must tell the software we're not using alignments. We're going to use feature lines, survey figures, and polylines. So you could select by layer. I'm going to select graphically. So I press select from drawing. I'll leave, leave my screen catch up a little bit here. So select from drawing. And I press that polyline. And press enter. And I press OK. So what we now see is on that same screen for the target mapping, we've picked alignments for one side and polylines for the other side. We can do the same for profiles. I won't go through it here. But when I press OK for this, and OK, and OK again, you will see that the corridor model has now been stretched to match both sides. So that is the basics of using strings to override your, um, your, your cross-sections based on assemblies. Now, the only thing you have to be aware of to do with all this is that there is an assembly here called Basic Road. Don't ever use that. That one will not allow you to do overridings of width. I don't know why it's even in here. The one that I always use is the um, the super elevation one. So let me just find the correct tab. Actually, it's on the PowerPoint, I think, so I can show it to you from here. Okay, I haven't put it in here yet. Um, basically, use the super elevation road as opposed to the basic road. That will allow you to change all the widths that you want. So we've done alignments and profiles, and we've done feature lines and polylines. The thing you can do now is combine them. So I've mentioned here that it's all about how you use these and how you combine these. So what I'm going to do here is show a different variation. Now there's a thing here called generic links. So whenever people see these cross sections with all the subgrade, they often tell me that they don't need to subgrade. They want to do a simple, basic line by itself, which is what I've got here. So the way you get to those is you go into your um, your subassembly lists in your tool palettes, and you go to generic links. And what you will see here are various combinations for sketching your own cross sections from scratch. Now the one that I use most often is this one here: link width and slope. The um, don't confuse it with link offset and slope. Offset goes from the center line only. Link width goes from the previous subassembly. And the way to learn to use these is to right click and select help. That will bring you straight into the help function for that particular one. And what you will see here on the help screen when it, when it comes up on your, on your webcast is that you specify a width, but the alignment offset can be overridden. So we have the, um, the width and the slope, alignment offset optional, and profile elevation optional. So what that means is this. I can use this assembly instead of my previous one and do the exact same thing that I just had a while ago. So just very, very quickly, I'll go back into my corridor properties. And all I'm going to do here is go to my parameters and tell the software. So at the moment, it's got assembly one here. I'm going to press that and say change it from assembly 1 to assembly 2. I should have named these better. I was in a bit of a rush this morning. So I'll change this to assembly 2. I'll press OK. And I'll quickly go into my targets. And from my, um, from my right hand width, sorry, from my, for this one here, I will select alignments, left, and I'll press add. And when I press OK, we should see a very similar thing to the previous one. I haven't done the other side, but 
Oh, I think I picked the wrong one here. I picked the left hand one. Okay, let me just undo that quickly. Okay, the screen's gonna lag a little bit here because I'm, I'm undoing things slightly. Let me go to my left hand one and select outside left and press add and press OK. OK and OK again. What we see is a very similar thing to our first step. But what we've done is modeled just the top surface only. Now we can do some pretty clever things here with the surface as well. So if I come in and pick this one here, and when your screen catch up, I'm going to right click and go to sub assembly properties. On my parameters, you will see the link codes. So that link by default is called top and datum. I can also call it Sean. That is just one of the links. So I press OK. When I go back into my corridor properties, so let the screens catch up here a little bit. I'm back in properties and I'm, I'm about to go to my surfaces tab. So I press surfaces here. This time I will build a surface. Again, I'll specify my style as being cyan triangulation. This time I'm going to specify the code as shown. Now it isn't showing up yet because I haven't rebuilt my surface. So let me just cancel that quickly. I'll right click and rebuild. And I'll come back into my properties. I'll just go through this quickly. Go to cyan. So it's going to be a bit of lag here again. Now I'll just pause here because on my specified code, I now have got a code called shown. So as you're building a retaining wall or a more challenging kind of a surface, you can add names to any of the links that you want and trigger those into specific surfaces to suit whatever design criteria that you want. So let me just finish this one off to show you what I mean. And we now see the triangulation for that side only. I think I've set my surface style to um, the incorrect one. But Let's just show this as triangulation magenta. Okay. And it crops up for us. So that's one of the options. Now the other option is what I've got here. We have combined in this one a generic link and a standard curve and gutter. So we're going to do two things with this one. The first one is pretty obvious. We're just going to build a corridor from it. Then we'll do something more interesting. So this is my generic link for the offset. And this is my curve and gutter. Let's just check how we're going for time here. I'm going to skip a few steps and go straight to the interesting part. I'm going to take this generic link. I'm going to go to my sub-assembly properties. And I'm going to go to my parameters and set omit link to yes. So what I'm doing here is I am telling the software I will model from the center line here. But you will start from an offset of 2.5 meters at a certain slope. So what's going to happen now, let me just zoom previous. I go to my corridor, I go to my properties again, and all I do is go back to my parameters, and I change my assembly from assembly 2 to assembly 3. So we press OK to this. I think my screen is lagging a little bit here, so let's give it a few seconds. So I've told the same corridor model to use that new assembly with the offset to the link. So what we now see, when I zoom in here, this is my corridor model. So my center line is here. I'm just grabbing it now. It's in it's the red and blue alignment. And my road starts at a certain offset from it. So that basically allows us to have all kinds of parameters in the same corridor model coming in from different areas. And by then combining our surface models from the corridors with various codes, we can control very much what we're going to build from it. So I think what we need to do with this stuff is get some examples going. So if anyone's got some, some ideas from what they see, we'd be very happy to hear them and showcase those in the future webcasts. I know there's some guys who do lots of retaining walls and kind of non-standard roads where these things come in very very handy. Now the last one that I put here is one that I'm sure many of you know. This one here is the uh, metric 
batters or they call them daylight where you've got the benching turned on so if I go to my benching properties here so again I go to subassembly properties and I go to my help button hey okay, I think I've broken this so parameters help here we go so this diagram explains it very very nicely you basically specified a maximum fill and a maximum cut and as the batters go above and beyond that benchings occur so it's perfectly standard kind of concept it happens to work very very nicely so again we go to our corridor properties and we will go and change our assembly again from assembly 3 to assembly 4 now the common mistake here is that you will easily forget to tell the software which surface to use for batters so you must go to your targets button here and you must tell it which to use for daylight left and daylight right so in theory you could have a different surface for each side of your road usually it's the same one so I've just pressed select all I pick natural surface I picked OK I pick OK again and I got some benching happening here now there isn't much happening here at the moment it's, um, it's a pretty modest bit of cut and fill because my profile design isn't very ambitious so I'm going to pick my profile design and drag it way down so the screen should be catching up about now so I've just basically placed my design to ensure we're going to have a lot of cut happening now I'm going to right click my corridor and select rebuild and we see all the benching coming in so what we could do here as well is in our in our corridor properties we can have the surfaces turned on and as we make our changes the surfaces update and all the various combinations that come with that now, I'm going to leave it there for the string stuff and move on to the more challenging areas there is a lot more to say on all this but we've got different levels of expertise in the session so again let us know what we should do in future for um, for, for expertise levels what we're now going to do is move from target mapping onto offset assemblies. Now these are quite an interesting concept. Every package out there that uses kind of a template based approach basically works from the center line and it projects out towards your various strings and as you hit in this case a bus bay your cross section doesn't go at 90 degrees to your outer string it keeps going in the same direction. So what I've got here on the left hand side where my highlight button is right now is a standard scenario. What offset assemblies allow you to do in a nutshell is to basically tell the software when you get to a certain string skew the cross section so it goes at 90 degrees to that string. So you get a really really nice and tidy model for bus bays in particular. So I've got an example of this so let's just open up a second drawing here. So we've got offset assembly 1. Okay, we can close this window. Now, um, what we've done here, let's just zoom into this one a little bit to show it off. I'll zoom again. So, just where my mouse cursor is from AutoCAD right now, you can see the way the cross section of my curb and gutter is skewing because of the offset assembly. On plan view we can see it as well so I'm going to zoom in on plan view to this area so just where, let me just draw a circle here so I can guide you to the correct place so where these two cross sections are you can see how the actual offset has skewed. Now that's a pretty basic one um, it can get more complex than that of course as well what I want to do first of all is just show you how the mechanism works so what I've got here is my basic assembly and here is my offset assembly. So I'm, I'm going to build a new one just so you can see how it works. So I'm going to go to assembly, create assembly and I'll call this one test and i place it here. What I, want, what I would now do is go and add some geometry to that so I'll go and on my generic links I will add my link width and slope so I want to go to the left hand side and I will just 
chuck that in here. So my screen's getting a bit fuller here, but that's my offset to my left hand side for my basic paved roadway. What I want to now do is pick my main assembly and I press the button up here for add offset. I can also right click and add offset and it gives you a nice big tooltip here which explains what it's going to do. So I press add offset and I put this over here. Now what I do is go to my curbs and I add my curb. So we do urban curb and gutter valley. I will add that one to my offset assembly. So the trick is that you have to have the um, when I want my curb to actually skew with the cross section it must be added to my offset assembly as opposed to my main assembly. Once that's done it will work. Some of the subtleties involved in it are that you have to tell the software to stretch your generic link to meet the actual curb. So on my corridor properties here on my main baseline I've picked an alignment and a profile. On my offset assembly I've also picked a different alignment and a different profile. You then stretch your cross section of your generic link to meet your offset profile and alignment and it just works perfectly. So um, that is the concept of it on a, more, on a very simple level. Let me just show you very quickly an example of a, a more ambitious method. So again I will go to file open I'll pick offset assembly 2. Now this one is representing a divided highway. So what you're seeing here on the left hand side it's a, it's a pretty rough drawing but we've got a, a, a bunch of benching batters off to the right. We've got two corridors left and right which are basically representing two lanes in a highway north and south and we've got a kind of a depressed median in between them. Now all of that is one corridor model. So when you actually look, let's just zoom in here a little bit. It's a good example of it just at this region. You can see that the cross section is skewing all over the place. We've got multiple assemblies, ah, sorry, we've got multiple assemblies with offsets controlling the different parameters. So if I just go to the right hand side here, you can see what we've used for our cross section. So there are there is our center line with the um, I'm actually using a mark point as well in this one, which is my next topic. But there's a center line with offset left and offset right for each carriageway. So this one here, for example, represents this side and the left, and the other one represents the right hand side. So the whole thing comes together as one big giant model. So that is a perfectly feasible way of doing a more complex highway using these parameters. Now again we can come back and do a full session on this quite happily but unfortunately not just today. So let's just go back to the PowerPoint quickly. So that's what offset assemblies are all about. Skewed cross sections in a nutshell. The next thing we've got are conditional assemblies. Now these are brand new and um, we haven't done a huge amount with them just yet but I want to make sure everyone's aware that they exist. Now the standard application for conditional assemblies is that you use them for batters. So if a like benching batters, for example, if my bench is above a certain value, do a certain criteria. They can be used in other scenarios too. So just to illustrate it, what I've done here, on the bottom left when this shows up, you will see my conditional subassembly. So what I've got is condition A and condition B. So just to make it very obvious, I'm saying if a certain line is within a certain distance of my center line, I want you to show what we've got in the bottom, which is a shoulder. If not, then I want you to show a curb and gutter. That's just to make it really, really obvious. So on the top viewport, what you will see here is my shoulders showing up. And on the bottom right viewport, you will see the plan view. So the thing to watch out on the plan view for is this red line. So the, the condition I've set up is that if that red line is within a certain distance of my road, show my shoulder. If not, don't. So I pick my red line and I grip edit 
so it's actually further away from my road and you will see on the top view that the shoulders have disappeared and the curbs have come in. Now the purpose of this is that when you're doing a highway you got to work out how your drainage is going to work and other various conditions that you don't necessarily want the software to automate everything but you want a very very quick way of changing what's happening. So what I'm doing here is building some visual control lines and when I place them in certain areas and rebuild my corridor the um, the relevant assemblies are appearing for me. So it means that I can do quite a lot without actually having to go select, right click, go into my corridor properties and remap parameters and remap assemblies. Now the question is how did I achieve all this? So let me just very very quickly show the criteria. You go to assembly and create and you go to your subassembly lists and you've got conditional. So you've got conditional horizontal target. So what we're saying here is the following. If, um, in this case I'm saying target found. So if the line is within a certain area, so I'm saying if you, if you find this target within, sorry, say target found, within a distance of I think I picked five meters, but it doesn't matter. Then do the following. Now, what you got here are conceptual layouts. So I'm saying on my modeling view, I want you to show this as one is to one. So target found in here is one is to one. What I would then do is repeat the process. So I'll say target not found. That's going to be minus one is to one. So what you're doing is you're, you're doing a graphical representation of yes or no for this scenario. So I accept those and I'll attach that to the same assembly. So you have case A and case B. And all you do then is attach the relevant subassemblies to each one. So having done this, let's just move this to one side. I say when the criteria is satisfied, I want my curb and gutter to be attached here. And when it's not satisfied, I want something completely different. So I want to have, let's just pick um, a trench pipe, for example. If it doesn't work, I want you to attach that trench pipe onto this one here. Now this is actually illustrated very nicely in the help file. So once again, if in doubt, you go to your conditional, which is just here. You right click and go to your help button and you will see the criteria being shown here. So the the red area here where they're showing um, let's, let's let the screen just catch up. The red for condition A and condition B show the examples of it. There is an example further down where they give multiple conditions. That might be on the other one. But it isn't just two. You can have as many as you want. So you can say, you know, if the line is within a certain distance, do the following. If it's within a certain distance, again, do the following or if you can't find the line at all, do something else. So it's it's more of an advanced parameter, but I want everyone to be aware that it, it exists. So if something arises where you actually have to do some conditional work, let us know. We'd be very happy to, to dive into one of these because it's a, a new and interesting kind of an area for us. So let's just rearrange some windows here. That's our conditional subassemblies. The the last one that we have is my favorite one, marked points. Now these have been around for a long time and not too many people have picked up how powerful they can be. So what we're showing here is a standard road design where you design your center line and you project grades from the inside out. So from your CL out to your curb and gutters and out to your batters. What we're doing with marked points is the exact opposite, if we want to. So this example we're going to show is um, my insertion point is here on the left-hand side. My marked point is on the right-hand side. We're going to work from both sides together towards the center, find where two batters meet, 
and put a ditch in. So this is actually a pretty common scenario for highways where you do off ramps and that kind of stuff. Basically it works exactly as the diagram shows. So here is a, actually a screen capture from the Civil 3D view where we've shown the attachment point which is where the assembly has been inserted. We've shown the mark point which is where we pushed it across to and how the two slopes have interacted and resolved this line here which is pretty hard to see with my current highlight but it's where the two green line, the two green batters meet. Um, a more kind of conceptual view of it is this one. So it's the exact same concept but I've got my assembly here. So this is my assembly insertion point. So this is my main assembly here which is attached onto my, my main design profile. My marked point is attached onto my highway and then my two batters resolve. So let me just show you that drawing. Now with this stuff um, you only really understand it when you play with it yourself. So if anybody wants this drawing let us know and um, that doesn't look too positive. Let us know and we'll send it out to you. I think I've broken something here but let me just ignore that if I can. Okay, I've done some visual basic stuff here which is causing some trouble. Okay, let me just start up a second session and fix that in a minute. But very quickly, I'll go into my Autodesk Civil 2010. I think what I've done here is um, I've picked a drawing from an old version from 2008 and opened it on 2010. Now even though that's supposed to work properly I'm always a bit suspicious of it. So I think what's happening now is that my assemblies haven't transferred across properly. So um, while that's starting up, let's go back to the PowerPoint. So uh, inserting the assembly onto your, your off-ramp design is pretty easy. The question is how do you tell it to use this one here for the mark point. So what you do is you build um, what we had earlier, you build a generic link and you set omit link to yes so it's invisible and you attach the mark point onto that end of the um, generic link. You can then use your criteria to specify that that mark point will go to the highway and once that's been done you basically use your um, your generic link for your two slopes to resolve the, the, um, the parameter. Now that is something I happen to have done on my blog, actually I think it was my very first post on it. Those screen captures you're seeing are actually from the blog. Now I've just brought it up here. I think your screens are catching up slowly. Um, I won't scroll through all of it, but basically what I'm describing here very quickly is spelled out in detail on this web page here. So before this session started, I posted on the forums that this blog article would be featured on it. So if anyone wants to find this lesson quickly, you can see it on the AC forums. Now I'll, act I'll actually leave out that last session because we're five minutes before the end. So what I'll just do is um, go to my final wrap-up slide. This is our summary. So just to re-emphasize, these offset assemblies, the conditional stuff and the mark points, these are advanced. If you find that they're too complex, it isn't the end of the world. Most of the bread and butter work happens through the basic corridors of the target mapping, which is essentially a combination of templates and strings, where you get, you get the best of both worlds from um, you get the best of both worlds from the string point of view of flexibility and from the template point of view of um, of getting quantities.